Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Nerdic Tuesday, our New England Regional Defense Industry Collaborative I-4.0 Readiness Ecosystem. Today, we have an exciting technology demonstration with our partners of Renishaw. For our opening remarks and agenda, uh, I'm Jackie Garifano, Chief Technology Officer at CCAT. I'll be kicking it over to Adam Boltek, who is an International Trade Officer out of New Hampshire. And then we have a, a, a really fantastic video uh, compilation that was put together by Justin LaBelle of Renishaw, Sales Application Engineer, and our colleague here at CCAT, Nasir Manon, Principal Engineer. So we may go over the one o'clock timeframe if you're watching this live, but again, a really exciting program that we have on that's focused on machine tool probing for Industry 4.0. So if you're new to Nerdic, if I could have Christy, thank you so much. Our Nerdic ecosystem is really a, a, a focus to on building our regional collaboration across our six New England states. As you can see with this circle here, we have a multidisciplinary approach that pulls in our manufacturing extension partnerships, our technology partners, academia and, and research entities. And we focus on technologies across i which are inclusive of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, generative design, and additive manufacturing, as well as model-based definition, which is effectively data, big data and analytics. So with that, uh, there's so much information that we have across our Nerdic ecosystem that you could find online at our website, on LinkedIn as well. So I won't take too much time. Joining me is Adam Boltek, again, International Trade Officer out of New Hampshire to provide us with some opening remarks. So Adam, take it away. Thank you, Jackie, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining in this demonstration. Um, as Jackie introduced, uh, my name is Adam Bolt from the state of New Hampshire, uh, the Office of International Commerce. Our state is a part of the Nerdic Collaborative, um, and, and we're absolutely thrilled to be a part of this, to work with other New England states to try and expand uh, industry resilience, expand supply chains, uh, and, and expand the business opportunities for uh, aerospace and defense firms throughout the region. I'm particularly excited to be here for this Industry 4.0 technology demonstration. As I was looking it up, I found that, uh, that the term Industry 4.0 is only about 10 years old. And already here we are putting together programs to help talk about how technology can really transform manufacturing uh, and the ways of doing businesses, uh, the way of doing business you know, here in New England, of course, and then uh, nationally as well. I don't think anybody could really doubt sort of some of the benefits that um, Industry 4.0 can, can promise, particularly in terms of increasing business competitiveness, uh, giving our companies a, a leg up over what would traditionally be perhaps sort of low wage offshore manufacturing. Um, the technology I think that we're going to see today is going to be a great part of that, seeing how we can use technology to increase quality, cut costs, and, and create sort of this feedback loop within the production processes uh, to make the products that we're manufacturing better. Just absolutely excited to see this and so glad to see that there are a lot of great companies uh, that are signed on to this demonstration and other ones that Nerdic, uh, in conjunction with CCAT, are putting on over the course of the summer. Uh, I'll definitely be around, and I'm sure I'm going to be asking questions uh, about what we see, but thank you all for joining us today. Great. Thanks so much, Adam. And to the point of asking questions, we do have a Q&A feature located in the GoToWebinar, so you'll find that across on the right-hand side in navigation. So please drop your questions. We will get to them after the conclusion of our video program. So as I mentioned, we have Justin and Nasir who are lined up to give us a really phenomenal uh, demonstration. Uh, again, the partnership between Renishaw and CCAT is really just something that we're very grateful for. And I'm, we're all really excited to be able to see what you gentlemen have to offer. So with that, please take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks and uh, good afternoon. And thank you for taking some time out of your schedules to join us. Uh, today, Justin and I will be presenting a model-based workflow for producing uh, a part and then in inspecting it right on the machine with uh, machine tool probing technology by Renishaw. 
Uh, we'll be walking you through the creation of the CAM program uh, to machine the part that you see on your screen um, using the model and embedded definition. Um, then Justin will walk us through creating the machine probing program using the same model. Um, we'll also run a video that we took on our CNC machine that will show the actual machining of the part, followed by the probing sequence and any corrective actions the system has to take as a result of the measurements. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and start the screen share. Machining 3D models with close tolerances can be a complicated process and typically would require any asymmetric tolerances called out in drawings to be machined to the mean of the tolerance. This can be somewhat time consuming to generate a, a CNC program for these kinds of parts. Today we'll be showing you an example process that reduces time in creating a machining program, machining the part, probing it on the machine and using Renishaw's Productivity Plus software to set up subroutines to automatically apply offsets to compensate for any undersized dimensions, all using model-based definition. For the CAM package, I'll be using SOLIDWORKS CAM that has a feature called tolerance-based machining which can leverage model-based definition dimensions, tolerance ranges, and surface finish annotations to select the correct machining strategies for operations and machine them to the, mean, uh, to the mean of asymmetric tolerances. What's nice about this function is that it eliminates long-standing issues surrounding differences between design practices required to tolerance parts based on uh, fit form and function versus manufacturing's need to machine geometry based on mean dimension and tolerances. This significantly reduces CNC programming time and enables smart manufacturing. On the screen, what I have set up here is a, an example model that has all of the um, tolerances built right into the model. So all my uh, model-based definition is, is visible here on the screen. I have my datum set up. Um, there are uh, three different uh, coordinate systems here uh, that reference uh, the, the datums that we'll go through. Basic dimensions set up just so that uh, and these are really just given to give an idea of what the stock material is going to be so my height here is about uh, an inch uh, 750, uh, 6 inches wide and then 9 inches long. Um, <coughs> I have my hole definition here along with the tolerance in there I have a slot cut out here again with a symmetric tolerance. We have slots that are set up here with asymmetric tolerances. And we have varying different surface profile to uh, that are referencing different datums here. So the first thing that I wanted to point out is that having the um, definition incorporated right onto the 3D model, it significantly reduces any error in, in uh, understanding what that tolerance is referencing, uh, which can sometimes be the case with uh, complicated 2D drawings. Here I can very quickly see that my datum A is this top surface. If I click on it, that datum uh, callout has associativity to the surface. My datum B is this hole back here. And you can see when I click on it, uh, it shows you the associativity again uh, with that hole. And if I click on my datum C here, you can see the associativity there as well. What's nice is that um, I can see where that uh, the reference coordinate system is. If I pick, for example, this um, <coughs> whole location that is referencing datum A, B, and C, uh, I can see my coordinate system that's placed where it's referencing from. Similarly, for my coordinate system that is referencing some of the other datums, for example, datum D 
which is referencing that top surface, datum E, the side wall, and datum F, this front face here. I can see right away that my coordinate system is set at the corner of this boss feature here. Similarly here, for this surface profile that's referencing datum D, G, and H, I can very quickly see the coordinate system that's set up at the corner there because, again, D is referencing this top face, G, that side wall, and then H, this front face here. So having this information embedded right on to the 3D model not only helps me uh, to read that information, uh, in that the information is presented in a human readable form but it's also in a in obviously a digital form so that the uh, so that my machine can consume that information the software that I'm using now and in, in, uh, in SOLIDWORKS um, the SOLIDWORKS CAM feature can read that information because it's you know not just human readable on a 2D drawing but it's embedded within the 3D file in a digital form and so the system can take in that information and use it to streamline processes. Uh, what's required is a couple of prerequisites. Uh, one, that I set up um, my manufacturing system, uh, give, give the system the parameters. In other words, what machine I'm using, the stock material, the, uh, the actual material. Um, and, uh, and then references strategies that I build in to the system uh, to then apply according to the tolerance that that is on uh, a particular feature so to to give you uh, a better understanding of what that is let's go ahead and go into uh, our SOLIDWORKS CAM tab and we'll go into our set up here. <coughs> We're going to be using uh, our DMG machine here at CCAT. Um, that uses an 840D control. So my post processor here is set up for Siemens 840D. We're, we're going to be machining in inches. So we've got that set up here. And then we've also set up our tool crib with a number of tools here. The particular machine that we have is a um, full five axis machine uh, with actually an additional uh, additive uh, laser tech system. Um, we're only going to be using the XYZ axis here, so we're just going to be strictly um, showing this demonstration on two and a half um, axis milling operations. So the next thing that we want to set up is our stock. If we click on the stock manager, you can see the uh, bounding box is automatically extracted. And then I have set in here my uh, bounding box offset. And I've set these up um, so that my stock size dimension equal what I actually have. And, this, and the material that we're going to be using is aluminum 6061. So that's also set up there. It references the uh, coordinate system 1, which you can see is set up here at the back. So because I have uh, my information set up, um, I'll just quickly take you through the default strategies. For holes, by default, I have set up drilling, uh, countersuck holes or drilling as well. Um, rectangular pockets um, are uh, a rough rest finish, um, and so on and so forth for the other <coughs> uh, features here. For my tolerance based machining, if I go into the settings, you can see that. Um, what we're looking at here, if I go into my tolerance range in inches, on the left we have oops, 
on the left we have our features um, so the different features that the system can recognize we have our default machining strategy and then for each of those features how many number of tolerance based conditions we have set up so in this case for the whole we have five different tolerance based conditions and you can see them down here um, we have the tolerance ranges set up and what the strategy is for undersized nominal or oversized um, dimensions what that means is for example if I go into and take a look at the width of this particular pocket uh, you can see that the dimension here is one inch plus three thousandths minus one thousandths so the span there is four thousandths so my t that falls within as an example uh, that will fall within my uh, two thousandths to twenty thousandths range here and because my tolerance is asymmetric um, the mean of this asymmetric tolerance range will be in the positive region so in other words if I take uh, if, if my span is 4000 and I add that to negative 1000 <coughs> or sorry divide that by 2 and add it to negative 1000 I'll get 1000 and that's in the positive so that will fall under my oversized strategy so whatever I have set up there and you can see that for tighter tolerances I have set up bore as my machining strategy for one ten thousandths to two thousandths I have set up reaming and then for the rest I have set up drilling another example is this pocket on the left I have again another asymmetric tolerance but this time it's going to be the mean will be on the negative side so it will be undersized uh, and what that is is I have a span of five thousandths and so the um, the mean of that will be uh, two point uh, or, or two, uh, two and a half thousandths and if you add that uh, will be still in the negative so that will again fall under my uh, fall under the two thousands to twenty thousands range under the undersized strategy so we'll take a look once we do the recognition uh, we'll come back into this dialogue and we'll see how well um, the system actually recognize the features but this is where you set your strategy up for your tolerance ranges you can also set up your tolerance ranges for, or your strategies, I'm sorry, for your uh, GD&T measurements as well here. So next, what we'll go ahead and do is we're actually ready since we have our machine set up, we have our stock set up, we have our tool crib set up with our tools identified. Um, we'll go ahead into the SOLIDWORKS CAM tab and extract, run the uh, uh, feature extraction here. You'll see a little dialog that pops up at the bottom left uh, as it runs through the different features to recognize them. And you can see uh, in our uh, CAM feature tree uh, we're set up uh, now with all the recognized features under the uh, the the mill setup one so here it's recognized the face feature it's recognized the uh, open pocket another open pocket here around the main boss open pockets around the inner bosses uh, the rectangular slot here, the, irre the irregular slot, uh, wh how it classifies these uh, as irregular slots back here. Um, you have your pocket here, the other one here, um, your hole, and notice that it, it assigned it reaming um, because it is the tolerance on that 
is plus or minus a thousand, and as we saw before, that that uh, brought it into our uh, Riemann category, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have other other features identified here. Um, the next step is to run our uh, to generate our operation plan. So we can go ahead and, and generate that. Uh, and before we get into that, I just want to go back into our tolerance-based machining, and let's go into our um, the run dialog. We can see that it has recognized a number of tolerances and assign the appropriate uh, machining strategy. So for example on this hole here um, we're set up for reaming and um, <coughs> the tolerance on this hole is plus or minus a thousand so it's a symmetric tolerance. In other words it should fall within the nominal strategy and if I hover my mouse over the one ten thousandths to two thousandths, uh, as you can see, it's it's colorized black um, because that's the tolerance range um, that that particular feature falls into. Um, you'll see as I hover my mouse over it in parentheses, you see a zero comma one comma zero. So it's recognized zero undersize, one nominal, and zero oversize. So as we expected. Um, it, it did correctly pick up that this is uh, a symmetric tolerance and it will fall under the nominal strategy within the range of the tolerance that 1000s fits into. Uh, for the countersink hole, same thing. Um, we have <coughs> our um, true position at 10,000 referencing um, datums A, B, and C. And this falls within the zero to twenty thousandths range, and this is going to be a symmetric tolerance. So if we hover our mouse over it, again, we're in the uh, you can see we're in the nominal strategy here. So we're going to be doing a drilling operation on that. Uh, similarly, for um <coughs> this irregular pocket, you see that it found two of four. So the two that it's referring to are are the uh, left pocket here and the right pocket here. And if I go ahead and take a look at the tolerances actually assigned on that, you can see that our range here is four thousandths and our range on this one is five thousandths. So that fall both of them fall within the two thousand to one inch range. And if I hover my mouse over it, one of them falls under the undersized strategy and another one falls into the oversized strategy. Um, and as we saw before, um, that indeed is the case because we have here this particular range will put the mean in the negative side and this one will put the mean in the positive side. The rectangular slot here, if we take a look at the width, um, this is again another asymmetric tolerance. We're at plus two minus zero. Uh, the range there is two thousand, so we fall within the zero to ten thousand range. And if I hover my mouse over it, you can see that we're in the oversized strategy. Uh, and same thing for the um, the rectangular slot that it's calling out here. So the tolerance on this is plus 3,000 minus zero, and that's a 3,000 range, so that falls within the 2,000 to one inch. And if I hover my mouse over it, again, we're in the oversized range. So it's, it's correctly picked up on these features and assigned the appropriate machining strategy based on what we had predefined. Similarly, uh, it will do that for the GD&T measurements as well. So now, if we go ahead back into our SOLIDWORKS CAM, we can generate our toolpath. And we can go and step through now um, our toolpathing to see how that looks. So we have a, uh, it's, it's using our <coughs> uh, uh, 630 drill with uh, corner round 
um, to do a roughing on the outside here um, and then we're going through and doing a <coughs> a contour mill around the perimeter to get rid of the majority of the stock from the outside and, and uh, bring that in and then um, again we're doing another roughing operation uh, to get the main the surface datum A uh, roughed out uh, and leaving the main uh, leaving the, uh, the secondary bosses in there uh, and then we have the contour um, to cut out those bosses <coughs> uh, some remaining roughing operations uh, again a c another contour uh, using our, our larger diameter drill and then we switch over to our flat end mill um, to cut out these slots and you, you can see there's no uh, inside uh, round corner on that so it's it's picked the appropriate tool um, notice also uh, I'll just go back to mention uh, that as it's doing this contour um, this particular tool has a corner round um, which is the appropriate tool to use here because we do have a, 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 cor a, um, a fillet here on these bosses <coughs> So if we continue down um, the path here, we can take a look and see uh, we've got a roughing operation for this pocket. Um, finishing contour, another roughing operation for this uh, pocket, a finishing contour. Um, and then I think somewhere down here. Yep. So we do also have the uh, the chamfer contouring path here on this one and also on this one. Um, so the best way to verify this now is uh, if we go ahead and uh, simulate our tool path, we can select the option up here. You can see our stock material there. And I'm going to slow this down a little bit and then speed it up slowly as we're uh, as it's going through this. I'll speed that up just a little bit more. So the system is using the larger tool uh, with the corner radius for the roughing operations to get rid of the majority of the material. Um, it selected that based on the features that it saw and our strategy that's set up along with the uh, the tolerances um, when it goes back to do the, the finish machining on these features. Speed that up as well a little bit. So you can see here now it's doing the finish contouring. and now it switches tools uh, and it chooses the appropriate tool based on the uh, the dimension that's called out on the width of that slot uh, and on these pockets and then it goes through and picks the the chamfer tool to be able to do the contouring on the, on the chamfer feature here on this part so the system um, you can see it significantly reduced my time in going through and manually uh, programming uh, the machining of this part. There are obviously a couple of additional uh, paths that I have to specify. Um, I have to, I, in my tool crib, I don't have a, a flat end mill small enough to be able to uh, mill out those uh, counter bores. 
So uh, if I go ahead and assign that tool and and um, or add that tool into my tool crib, uh, then I can go ahead and generate the tool paths with these automatically, or go ahead and do it manually. Um, and I I'm gonna probably have to add uh, a couple of operations to finish off these features here. Uh, again, I probably just didn't have the um, uh, a tool small enough to get in there um, and then to, to machine off these top faces here as well. So again, um, with the information that's contained within the model, um, you know, the system is seeing, uh, obviously it has all the information about the dimensions of everything. Um, because the model inherently contains that and then with the tolerances it's choosing the right machining operation based on what I have set up um, and it's automatically calculating the path to machine to the mean of the tolerance of any asymmetric tolerance so that is also a, a significant time saver for me as well Really, the next step from here is to go ahead and post this code. We're going to do it for the 840D. And we'll go ahead and post out the code. And uh, what we'll do next is I'll uh, we'll switch over to, um, I'll hand it over to uh, Justin Liebel uh, from Renishaw who will show Renishaw's Productivity Plus software and uh, he'll walk you through s setting up uh, a probing operation based off of um, the 3D model and uh, setting up the subroutines uh, that will be used to automatically compensate for any features that are undercut um, uh, size-wise uh, once the uh, uh, machining operation is completed and the initial probing uh, routine is run. In our previous presentation on the benefits of on-machine tool probing and its relationship to Industry 4.0, we found that there are four design principles of Industry 4.0. The four design principles are interconnection, information transparency, technical assistance, and decentralized decision. In recapping the benefits applied to the four principles of Industry 4.0, we find that interconnection of machinery and people is supported by our machine tool applications, such as Reporter, which can report live data from the machine tool as parts are being measured. This can be collected to our new Renishaw Central software as a single location to view your entire factory data stream. Information transparency is afforded real time by the measurements taken by the probes. Is the process in control? Is it losing control? Actions can be proactive during the process instead of reactive after the process is finished. Technical assistance is gained by letting the probes measure work offsets, tool offsets, and features automatically in the machine. This makes the process faster with less intervention by operators and makes the operation safer. Decentralized decisions occur with logic written directly into the CNC cutting program. Probes can inspect parts and tooling to ensure sizes are met or broken and damaged tools are flagged. Logic statements can help the process continue on its own or alert an operator to an anomaly. This moves the bulk of the decision making to the machine driven by data. These achievements ultimately help create more sustainable manufacturing with reduced waste, increased throughput, and valuable resource usage. So we're going to take a look here at Productivity Plus Active Editor Pro. This software is designed to help program your machine tool probe um, for measuring features, setting work offsets, adjusting tools, but it uh, uses the CAD model of your part to help uh, with the programming rather than having to write standard G codes or, uh, or macros to, to actually uh, perform those tasks. The CAD model that we're looking at here uh, was created within SolidWorks. Uh, it can be imported into Productivity Plus either as a standard SolidWorks model or uh, as an IGIS or STEP file or a parasolid, there's a handful of um, imports available uh, from uh, many different CAD systems that are out there. The coordinate system is aligned uh, to the native file, but the part can be relocated or moved once uh, inside of Active Editor Pro here. Uh, you can simply uh, relocate the triad to a feature uh, on the part uh, or set an offset to it. 
So wherever you're going to actually have your part zero set uh, on the model, that's where you can uh, relocate uh, if, if it's different uh, from the, the native coordinates of the model as it was created. So for our presentation today, we're going to go ahead and actually create a handful of measurements uh, on this part. We'll do some, um, some holes, some edges, some uh, webs and pockets, and then uh, decide what to do with those results, whether we want to actually make any machine adjustments uh, or perform any, uh, say, tool, tool length adjustments, tool diameter adjustments. And likewise, we can insert some logical statements to you stop the machine should something come out of tolerance. Uh, and then at the very end, we can generate a full report from all the measurements taken. So the model as is can be manipulated. You can change the views. You can do top to, uh, top view, left view, right view, uh, isometric. Uh, you can also pan and rotate the model as well. So any uh, of the standard CAD function for viewing the model is available. The first thing we'll actually do here is set a measure point. And we'll just come right off the top surface here. We'll see that one item has been selected. We'll go ahead and press enter. Now, because we're picking off the model, it describes that uh, position exactly from wherever your uh, XYZ zero location is. Um, so it defines an approach point as well. And then uh, if there's any safety plane motion, retract safety plane, uh, whether or not we want to uh, output the points as well. And then um, if there's a position tolerance on that. So because this is just a single point, we'll actually just leave that as such. And then we'll go and uh, measure a circle as well. And we'll pick the hole here. Center is uh, 000. The diameter is 0.525. It is an inside feature. We're not using any stock allowance. And we can define the depth as uh, minus 0.2. Now that is from the uh, the, the feature uh, zero point. So we pick the top edge of that feature. We can define whether it's a um, macro three point, macro four point, uh, linear circular distance. We'll just stick with our standard three point. Again, defining your safety plane, retract uh, planes, things like that. Now, whether or not you want to uh, actually output the points, hovering over any of these features brings up a description of it. So this uh, outputting of the points uh, enables the output of the measure points to a printer file, uh, printer or file, excuse me. The data can then be analyzed externally. So the output position is the bottom of the stylus ball, not the center. So this only has an effect when processing for um, macro mode, which is what we are using. If you have to output the stylus positions in the CNC plugin, please use the uh, report type property in the report statement. So. Uh, we will end up reporting most of these features anyway. So, uh, but again, you can apply a diameter or position tolerance uh, if you need to. So with these values here, we've created our inspection cycle. This has some uh, default values as well for standoff and over travel. We wanna make sure we pick the correct probe that we're gonna be using. In our case, it's an OMP60. The uh, safety plane has a default of two inches. And then the uh, current work coordinate system is G54. That's what we're going to be using. And again, uh, this applies a bunch of default tolerances as well. You can change these uh, for each individual feature. Having created these two measurements, we um, can actually choose to do a uh, NC update, so our machine update. So we'll click on this, and we want to actually do a, a work coordinate system update. So we will update G54 from that feature. It's gonna be an update rather than a set. And we're gonna pick the feature. So in our case here, let's pick point one. And uh, it knows that that's a Z direction. So we're gonna say yes, use Z. And we're going to actually update from there. We're gonna do another update for uh, G54. Pick the circle this time. And it's going to use X and Y, you can choose if you just wanted to use X or Y, we'll use both. So now what this uh, routine here is going to do is actually measure a point on the top surface, measure the circle, and then update G54 to the top surface, wherever that happened to be machined, and then update the uh, center of the bore as our X, Y, Z, zero. 
So next what we'll do is create a series of uh, measurements for additional features. You can choose to use all the same inspection cycle, um, but depending on the feature type, you may want to create a new inspection cycle. So we'll go ahead and start a new one. And the reason we're gonna do that is because uh, the standoff distance here, uh, we have to make this a little bit smaller for some of these smaller holes. If the standoff is too large, what will happen is when the probe takes a point against the uh, inside of the hole and it backs off, it will actually hit the other side of the hole due to the size of the stylus and the size of the hole. Uh, two ways to get around that are to uh, decrease the standoff distance or to uh, use a different size stylus. In our case, we are limited. We have one size stylus that we have available to use on this particular application. So uh, we have to adjust the standoff. The standoff is controlled uh, as part of the inspection cycle. If I go back to the original inspection cycle, you can see that the standoff distance is the default uh, 100 thou. The standoff distance for inspection cycle two is uh, 30 thousandths. So within inspection cycle two, we'll go ahead and um, measure some features. So we'll go ahead and put the inside of the holes here. Click on this. And you can select multiple features in a single go. These are all the same size. We're going to measure them as um, uh, circles. We'll uh, measure the inside diameter. Now the inspection depth also on these features um, might be a little bit too deep due to the uh, depth of the feature and the size of the ball. So we're going to cut that to uh, about 35 thousandths below the top edge. Uh, we'll use again three point macro to measure the diameter and go ahead and accept that. Now, as you start to build these features, if you want to um, see what you've done, you can go to the visualization and actually simulate it. So there's our touch points and we can see now we've got a collision detected. So it went to the hole here, but something, um, it touched a feature that is not supposed to. So if we go back to our design, and select our circles, uh, we should be able to change our inspection depth. Maybe we'll go to 20 thousandths instead of 35 thousandths. Should change for all because we did a shift click there. So let's go back to our visualization, touch point, come over, and now you can see we're executing the whole measurements without any collisions. So it's a good idea to um, kind of continually check as you go if you're uh, unsure of the clearances and things like that. So we've got uh, now our first inspection cycle with a single point and a circle and then establishing a new offset or in our case, maybe adjusting an offset. And then uh, inspection cycle two, we're simply just measuring some circles. So uh, the inspection cycles, uh, you can also rename them. So maybe we'll just call this one holes. So now we've got uh, inspection cycle for holes. Maybe we'll rename this one and call this uh, WCS because we're setting our work coordinate system there. And we can go ahead and minimize those in the tree, come down and start a third inspection cycle. I'm gonna leave the defaults for now, but I always wanna change the probe to the one we're actually using. Everything else will stay defaulted until uh, unless we have to change it. So we'll go ahead and rename this, and let's call this one uh, uh, Web Pocket. So our inspection cycle here is Web Pocket. So now I'm going to measure some webs and pockets on this part. First feature here I'll select is the inside uh, wall here, and then we'll rotate around and select the opposite edge. So because we've selected the opposite edge, <clears throat> it knows that the feature is an inside pocket. Uh, it's going to pick the points by default, uh, the start points rather. Uh, the width is determined by the model. It's an inside feature. You can add clearances to the start and the end. So if you were too close to the edge, you would be able to uh, pull those in or extend them out. Uh, the inspe inspection depth here is minus 0.2. Uh, again, we'll leave that as our default for now. Uh, all these other values here, 
we will apply a tolerance on the width. So we'll go here and the width tolerance plus seven and minus one. You can apply tolerances for the midpoint, parallelism, straightness as well as the sides. So we'll go ahead and hit okay. And now we have our feature defined here. So we can go ahead and actually do that for the second pocket over here. Take this edge, take the edge opposite. Uh, I'm gonna leave the defaults there. We'll set the new tolerance again as a custom. So plus seven and minus one. Okay, so now we have these two defined. Again, if we go to visualization, we can play everything from the start, inspect the holes. And then come in and inspect the pockets. Very good. So with that done, uh, let's do an outside uh, measurement. So we'll be measuring the web. So we'll go ahead and uh, create a new feature here. We'll pick this and then rotate around. Pick the opposite side here. Uh, again, it's picking it up. It knows that it is now an outside feature. Uh, based on the model. Uh, everything here I'll leave as our default. You'll notice that it actually went above one and two because my cursor was on the inspection cycle. So it always puts the feature uh, one section or one uh, level below where you were uh, when you created it. So we'll go ahead and duplicate this for the second web over here. Take our first side, take our second side, And I'm okay with our defaults for now. Go ahead and visualize. You can change the speed at which the visualization runs, slows way down all, or go all the way to the maximum. Here it's gonna measure the inside, inside, and then outside, and outside. Great. So at this point, we've measured a handful of features, but now if, um, if we want to try to, uh, say, update a tool offset um, based on the actual measured value of the feature, uh, we can set some logic statements in here. So if we go to our design and we look at pocket one, which is this first feature here, uh, we applied a tolerance to that uh, earlier on where it was a plus seven minus one. So we know that the, the width of that has a, a, a limit on just how big and how small it can be. If we uh, pursue that and want to introduce some logic, what we can do is create an if-then statement uh, based around that feature. So we can say if uh, web pocket number one and the uh, width of web pocket number one specifically, is less than 0.399 because the nominal is four, uh, point 0.4 rather. The uh, tolerance is minus one thou plus seven thou. The lower limit would be 0.399. So if we say that if the measurement comes back as less than 0.399, we need to then do something. So uh, from there, you can say, uh, if the pocket is less than 0.399, then do a machine update. So we want to then do a tool diameter update. Tool 11 is what cut that feature. We can say the edge number is one and the feature is web pocket one. So it's going to take the measured value from web pocket one and uh, take the difference between the actual and the nominal and apply that difference to the tool offset register. You can also choose to um, change the percentage of that feedback. The reason for this is uh, when you're trying to keep a process in control, there are some um, potential um, things going on in the machine such as tool deflection 
that may or may not be repeating every single time. So you end up in a state where if you're correcting 100% of the difference every single time you um, measure the part, you may go back and forth uh, between each part. So in that case here, you might uh, only update 80% and that would actually keep you within, uh, within a, a tolerance uh, minus say the tool deflection results. So we can go ahead and accept that. So we now have a statement here that says if web pocket uh, one, the width is less than 399, then go ahead and update the machine tool, um, uh, the machine tool, tool offset for tool 11. Now simply updating the tool offset um, is not going to help with this part. It would help with the next part because the tool offset would be updated there. If we want to help correct this part while we still have it in the machine, we can then insert yet another uh, command, and that would be a simple G code block. So the G code block here would be after the update, and that G code could be simply something along the lines of go to N100. Now, in that example, N100 would be a line number at the top of the operation which created this slot. So if the um, tool is, uh, sorry, if the web is measured to be less than 0.399, then update the tool offset and then go back and remachine that feature. We need another statement here uh, to be able to say what happens if it's within tolerance. We just want it to continue on. So we can say uh, an then statement and then an else if statement. So we can say if um, the web pocket is, the width of that is greater than, uh, going to be 0 0.407, that would be the upper limit tolerance. We can then insert a G code block saying what to do, and we can simply put an M00 and then comment to say feature over size. So in which case here, if the, um, if the pocket is less than this value, update the offset and then go to um, line 100, which would be the start of the operation to then remachine it. If it's over that value, then stop the machine because it is now outside of the tolerance and there's no point in continuing the operation knowing that the feature is incorrect. If it doesn't meet either of those criteria, it will simply pass down through the program onto the next operation. So with these features created and the logic statements added, we can go ahead and uh, collapse the tree here. I'm going to create one more inspection cycle doesn't really matter what we select here, uh, as this inspection cycle is only going to contain the report. So we can go ahead and actually generate a report for the program. Uh, we can choose whether or not to include the tolerances in the report. Yes, we'd like to do that. Uh, we're going to report the results, uh, whether or not they are in tolerance, and if there's a header on the uh, file. So we can include some text, and I can just call it um, Nerdic. And then uh, the footer, let's just put a, a date there. And we'll left justify those, hit OK. Now the report is uh, going to be empty until we actually put some features inside of it. So we'll go ahead and include these features here, these small circles that we measured, and then the webs and pockets. We'll click and drag these down. So now these are actually going to be reported. We do this at the end of the program simply to save some uh, processing time uh, instead of having the report be generated in the middle of the program as you're trying to run the probe. We simply do it at the very end uh, after the probe is finished taking all of its measurements. Okay, with all of our features measured and uh, inspections complete, we're going to post-process this program. We have uh, what is called the RenMF file, which is specific for the, uh, the machine that this is going to be running on. And then we're going to uh, set a location here to actually save the results. So we'll say 
hosted. And we'll call it program number three. Make sure we change our program number here. Go ahead and post our code. Everything worked. Close this. And I'll pull up the programs. Okay, we'll come down here. Here's our posted folder. Here's our programs. So it spits out a main program followed by all the sub programs needed to operate the probe. We open up the main program. It's again defining all of the sub programs needed. And then this program is going to contain all of the positions for all the features and all of the correct callouts. And then at the very end, it's going to write all of the results, which is our, going to be our pro, um, report. Uh, and then also part of this program is again, jumping to um, or changing the work offsets and changing the tool offsets. Okay, with our programming done, we'll go ahead and make sure that our file is saved and go ahead and watch this live on the machine. So at this time, um, the system is, uh, you can see the, <clears throat> the stock material there that's set up in the vise. Um, the camera's off to the side, so the, the door of the machine is actually on the left side of the screen here. And it's going through right now, uh, as we saw uh, during the um, creation of the NC program. Um, the system uh, is doing the roughing cycle right now. And uh, notice the tool in there. Uh, that's the tool that it automatically detected based on the um, the limited number of tools I had set up in the tool crib uh, for it to choose from. But it's, it's chose the, the largest uh, end mill um, to do the roughing operation from. And so it'll, it'll go through and just rough out the basic shape first. And so next, it will change tools and start doing um, some of the hole drilling, some of the counter sinks. And uh, during this video, we, we did um, turn off the coolant and we intermittently turn it on. So you'll see kind of um, every now and then uh, the coolant kind of splashes on the part. But we tried to keep the coolant off just for the sake of the video. Uh, but you can see here that um, the tool, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the system again went to the uh, smaller end mill to do the um, counter bore holes as well as the circular milling path uh, for the top holes there. And it's going to come through now and do the uh, actually use a ball end mill to mill out the, um, the, the circular features, uh, the, the dimples at the top there of the second boss. And then here it's uh, cutting out the, the pockets. And then next it'll go through and actually rough out the slots in the two smaller bosses uh, that are on the front of the part. <clears throat> And while these toolpaths were generated off of the model Nasir, uh, the the generation of that is based on a set of rules that you define. So if uh, things go um, not quite the, the way you want, you can always change the rules, correct? Correct. So uh, what we see here now is after the part was machined, uh, we're coming in with the uh, OMP60 probe. So it's an optical probe with a 50 millimeter long stylus with a six millimeter diameter um, ruby tip. So uh, as you saw on the uh, program, you've got uh, 
the uh, probe coming in, touching the, the top of the boss there as your uh, Z hit, and then taking uh, the XY position inside the hole. Uh, we did an update on the work offset there. And then we're going out to the four corners uh, where we're measuring those counterboard holes. Uh, it's taking three points in each hole, and all these measurements are macro-based. Now, we've got a couple different um, software packages that we use. Uh, most of them create uh, uh, macros or, or use a set of macros to actually uh, drive the probe. Um, so with a, a series of uh, simple inputs to the macro, you define what it's going to do. So we've gone and we measured the, uh, the holes in the corners, and now we're measuring the inside slots there, those pockets. So we take uh, three points on either side of each pocket. And uh, what we're actually going to do is measure the width of those uh, slots. With the measured results from that, we're going to uh, take uh, and update the uh, diameter or radius offset of the tool that cut those features based on whether or not the feature is um, under or oversized. So uh, you can choose to do that with any of the features that you're cutting as long as you know what tool was used to actually produce those features. So it's a convenient way to um, have uh, lights out manufacturing, uh, or generate your in-process control so that you're not waiting for the part to be completely finished, come out of the machine and be inspected off the machine only to find out that it either needs rework or um, the feature has been cut oversized and, and now you have to scrap it. Um, in the meantime, if it is scrap and you don't find out till later, you may already be cutting a second part at that time. Uh, by the time you learn the first part was bad, the second part may already be uh, out, out of tolerance as well. So, um, so again, what you see here is uh, going through the, the probe cycle that uh, was generated with the Productivity Plus software. So the initial measurement showed that the uh, pocket was 0.3947, so it was uh, undersized. Tool 11 had an initial radius of uh, zero, so there was no offset from the CAM program. And then the uh, updated was about two thousandths difference. So now the machine is going and uh, re-performing the operation just for those slots. And you can see just a tiny bit of material being removed there. Uh, and that's an indication that the offset uh, has now shifted that tool path slightly based on the initial measurements from the probe. So because we are undersized and we are below the tolerance, which was uh, 0.399, uh, by a significant amount, uh, we shifted um, the tool path by about two thousandths on either side. So we're going to come in, re-machine that feature, and then uh, we go ahead and actually probe it a second time, uh, just coming in and uh, running through uh, the same uh, process. So we speed up the footage here a little bit. And I do want to mention, too, that the, the feeds and speeds used for probing uh, are completely adjustable. Um, you can change how fast things go. Um, typically, we go at a, at a default feed rate, uh, but if the machine is a fairly robust, you may be able to speed it up and still uh, maintain uh, accurate results and reduce your cycle time. So now that we've gone through and actually measured everything for a second time after we uh, machine that uh, one section, we can see now the final results there are uh, 0.3998, so they're within the tolerance. So now that feature has actually passed the inspection. Uh, this is just a sample of the, of the full report that uh, was generated by um, the software. The, um, uh, the report actually it gives measurements for every single one of the features that, that, uh, that we had created in the uh, Productivity Plus uh, report generator. So. Um, so again, uh, excellent way to actually uh, close the loop on the production without uh, having to intervene. Um, when you look at uh, Industry 4.0 and those, those four design principles talking about uh, interconnection, information transparency, your technical assistance, and the decentralized decisions, the on-machine probing hits all of those um, because you're using the machine tool probe to gather data live. Uh, you're not waiting for it to come off the machine uh, before you uh, before you know what uh, you're actually um, uh, producing. The uh, the probing is helping to reduce uh, any manual intervention. So again, setting up your work offsets or setting up your tool offsets automatically are done by the machine. Uh, and then uh, writing a logic directly into the NC program to say, 
if your feature is undersized, uh, go ahead and actually make an adjustment and recut that feature. So, um, so all in all, uh, again, um, probing is hitting all four of those uh, those points uh, for the design principles. Justin, can you stay on to take any questions for us? Absolutely. So oh, I thank do. You. Thank you, Nasir. Yeah, thank you for uh, typing in the questions here. I see two coming in, um, and I, I do encourage you to uh, continue typing in your questions. If we don't get to them, we will answer them um, and get back to you. But I do see two here real quick. So the first one here is, um, <clears throat> Will this webinar be available for download as a video file? Um, you can certainly view it. Um, you can just, uh, you, you'll get a link after this um, webinar closes. And uh, anybody that wishes to view this webinar can just register as they would have uh, if they wanted to attend. Uh, and then they'll get that link in the email to then uh, view, the, uh, view the video. Um, as well, you're gonna get a link to the presentation material as well. Um, the second question, can Productivity Plus be integrated into NX software? Uh, so Productivity Plus does have an add-in for NX, but it's through a company called Janus, uh, which I believe is out of Germany. Um, we're working with them uh, a little bit here in the States, but uh, I, you'd have to get in touch with uh, some of our engineers in the Chicago office to get a little bit more detail on that. Um, I do know that we have an add-in right now for Mastercam. Uh, it does work um, seamlessly with that. Uh, that's kind of the, the major one at this point, but there is a project uh, involved with NX um, uh, out of a, a, a third-party company called Janus. So thanks for that question. And uh, uh, again, I do encourage you to keep uh, typing them in if you, if you have any. We're gonna, in the interest of time, keep moving forward. Um, so we, uh, we have opportunities for defense supplier companies to participate on technology demonstrations. Uh, if your company has at least 5% of your sales in one of the last five years that ultimately benefited the Department of Defense, uh, we do welcome you to apply for these no cost demonstration projects at ccat.us uh, forward slash nerdic. Uh, for slash apply. Um, these demonstrations are intended to be presented, so preferably, um, you know, we're looking for non-ITAR or export control projects. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can work with you to identify components of the project that can be recorded and presented. Um, specifically, we're seeking more project applications for additive manufacturing pilots. Uh, companies that are exploring additive manufacturing or would like to be introduced to the benefits of additive manufacturing are invited to submit an application for this uh, no-cost technology demonstration. Um, some of the applications that additive manufacturing is, is a great solution for include lightweighting, assembly consolidation, and uh, geometry optimization. Uh, complex parts that fit within an eight-inch cube um, that have long lead times or are expensive to produce would be uh, prime candidates. Uh, and we have extended the date to apply uh, for this to July 31st. Um, upcoming technology workshops, we have a, a number of demonstrations coming up over the next two months. Um, on July 20th, uh, 12 to 1, Stanley X will present the results of the pilot projects underway um, using their AI-driven DPAL platform. Uh, on July 27th, 12 to 1, SpearGen will present the results of the augmented and mixed reality pilot projects um, that are currently underway at, at uh, the second company. Um, on August 10th, 17th and 31st, uh, 12 to 1.30, uh, the results of the additive manufacturing demonstration projects will be presented by CCAT and our technology partners at Berkshire Innovation Center, um, University of Maine, Center for Advanced Manufacturing of Metals, and Vermont Technical College. Uh, the presentations on these technology demonstration projects are meant to illustrate uh, really real world applications of these technologies. Uh, what challenges in manufacturing these technologies help to address and how the technology was applied between the different uh, pilot projects and what the outcome was. So we do welcome you to register to attend these uh, presentations at ccat.us forward slash nerdic. Uh, we did wanna make you aware of this great opportunity for manufacturing companies. Um, the US Air Force um, desires to expand the US supply chain capacity to manufacture small turbine engine parts. Uh, and, and these are 
uh, engines that produce less than 2,000 uh, pound for, uh, force of thrust. Uh, thrust. Um, the goal is to really reduce the cost and delivery schedules for existing suppliers and stand up additional suppliers, including from non-aerospace industry sectors. Uh, we welcome you to visit sep.ccat.us for more information and apply for consideration for this program. <clears throat> With that, um, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we hope the presentation and the, and the, and the great question um, that were asked helped to understand the benefits that our machine program brings to manufacturing. Uh, if you do have any further questions, again, please do feel free to contact us and we'll be sure to get your questions answered. Uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Azir.